Welcome, Foul Tarnished. You are listening to Elden Kings, an Elden Ring discussion. Tonight's topic is Elden Ring lore and its parallels to the older from Soft games. Uh, joining us to that end is Aesir Aesthetics, a special guest with a lot of knowledge in the history of Elden Ring. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to solve all of the questions together. Uh, welcome to the round yeah. table hold, Aesir. Great to be here. Great to be here. I think it's very, uh, very honored. I'm very honored to be uh, called knowledgeable on these games uh, because basically I, I know everything I do by messaging people at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night and asking like the good data miners, what is this? What's this? <laughs> and, uh, I know that I've bounded Loki a couple times on Twitter for translation questions myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like Loki is just like hot key on uh, on my Discord. Same with Sophie. Same with Sin. Same with Casative and Mimi. It's just like okay, I need to know something about the Shingoku Jedi. Mimi, what what's this in the Shingoku Jedi? And then like three hours later, she's like, ah, oh, okay, let me look this up. <laughs> <laughs> the life of a lorehound is never easy, is it? The. <laughs> uh, Nope, and they're like, they're the elves. They're the elves that work in the background while everybody else gets the attention. <laughs> Santa's little helpers, one could say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, getting into it, I mean, there's a veritable list I could rattle off about the parallels between Elden Ring and uh, the previous games made by From Software. Like, in my opinion, it's the Souls trilogy retold in story, but with a different setting and some different key events yes. being changed around. Uh, yeah. Before we get into it, I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Like, did anything stand out to you when you first played or on subsequent playthroughs? So, um, I think we should uh, back up a bit, because the way From Software tells stories, uh, and we know this because we've uh, opened up the files and data mined their games a lot, we see that there there will be a build of the game, and then maybe halfway through development, they'll just fork it and they'll change directions completely. But what also happens is that stuff which doesn't make it into the final cut often finds its way into subsequent games or into DLC. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So when uh, when like I was I did a lot, I did a big Bloodborne video back in the day, and I was like, here are a lot of interesting ideas that were kind of like. Like, like that, like the whole idea of beasthood creeping up the right leg. Like this idea that you you halt halt the transformation by cutting off the limb, which then we see again in Sekiro. But then it's a much more pronounced theme of like people losing their limbs uh, to ward off these transformations. Same with like centipedes living inside the body. That's like the the image of the vermin, um, which you can collect from uh, by beating players for the leak. It's it's like it's a it's a centipede in a pool of blood. And you have things like the bloodletting beast and the the Lauren Silver beasts, which are full of maggots and parasites um, that are that are actually the things that are animating them, which becomes a bigger theme in Sekiro. And it's like, oh, so here's like Sekiro is kind of just like you just picked up all these leftovers from uh, Bloodborne and you cobbled them together into this ninja game. That's really cool. So going into Elden Ring, I was very sure that what we were gonna get was basically the Dark Souls 3 that we didn't originally get. And just like you said, uh, yep, that's pretty much what it is. Yeah, I love the I love the way that you uh, focus on Dark Souls 3 specifically, because there's so many concepts from that game that were cut and then re-added to Elden Ring in a new image, you know? Already mm -hmm. the idea of the Lord Hunt, of taking down these misbegotten demigods that have abandoned their duty, is the same concept as the uh, Ashen One going and hunting down the Lords of Cinder, who are miscreant from their thrones, you know? Yeah. You've got this repeating yeah, yeah. idea of, like, the Abyss run wild, like, those, um... The famous, like, big dark Abyss, like, humanity enemies where it explodes out of them before Osiris, those were, like... That was that yeah. imagery was reused a lot as well. Yeah, and uh, those, uh, those tree ulcer enemies, they are those uh, cut serpentine... Uh, Dark Abyss enemies from the promotional material. Yes, precisely. Uh, there's, also, there's also this whole idea of, like, you go to An Orlando in the first game, and then you go to An Orlando again in the third game, but it's covered in ash, which is then, like, changed into snow last minute, and Irithyll and all that becomes a snow area instead of an ashen area. 
But then in Lendell, it's like, no, you go, you go back to an Orlando, we call it Lendell now, and then you go back to it in the same game, but it's covered in ash. And it's like, oh, okay, I, I see what you did there. <laughs> you have all of the story concepts pushed into one, and you even have the idea that it's covered in ash by your own hand, you know? It's not Lords of mm -hmm. Cinder infinitely relinking the flame, it's you burning down the Erd tree. It is, uh... It's a much more direct focus on the player's action in Elden Ring, I feel like, is what they tried to... One of the more, like, emphasized yeah. changes. Yeah, definitely. Um, something that I've never really liked about the Dark Souls games is that the player character doesn't have any role in subsequent games. So, like, in Dark Souls 3, there's no point where you can find, um, like, like an undead soldier wearing, you know, the... the, the um, say Oscar's uh, armor set, like the elite knight armor set or the regular knight armor set. And like with just implication that, oh, that's the that's the lingering body of the chosen undead. Whereas like, remember that, po I don't know if you've played it, but there's that Pokemon game. I also haven't played it, but it, it ends with like the final boss being against Trainer Red, who's like the protagonist of the first game. And everybody's like, oh my God, that's so cool. Um, but that sort of, that continuity is a lot more... Uh, tangible in Elden Ring because you know it's 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 you all all the way out um and this whole narrative is built on the actions that you're performing whereas uh in previous games you kind of just show up after the fact yeah that's um that's a very good point there's much more there's much less after the effect actions in Elden Ring mm -hmm. like i feel like all of the previous games adhered to some extent to this three act structure where in the first act you are a normal person who is being thrust into destinies beyond your comprehension like in dark souls 1 you're an undead following the prophecy but any undead can follow the prophecy it's not until you get to sen's fortress and you begin act 2 and you go to places that have not been accessed forever and I think yeah. that's sort of mirrored in Elden Ring, right down to the fact that getting up to the Altus Plateau requires reuniting both of the Dectus halves of the medallion, which sort of spiritually echoes re uh, yeah. ringing the Bells of Awakening in a way. Yeah. And like that that reveal of uh, now you're in the Golden Plain uh, is very similar to when you first step into Anne Orlando. Precisely. Right down to like, I won't completely I never, uh, I never connected that. Oh, really? But uh, that's a good observation. <laughs> I think the entrance to uh, the Altus Plateau is is very memorable to me from my first playthrough. I quite enjoyed like the way that it spiritually echoed the ascent to Anna Orlando, but it's, uh, it's so much more expanded from what that was, right down to the point where rather than uh, going through the upper parts of Anna Orlando, where you just get to mm -hmm. see the City of the Gods, you get to actually go through it. I feel like they made a very keen attention to detail on making Landel fully explorable as this fantasy city. Yeah, and um, this was pointed out to me by Sophie from Sinclair Lore, but um, when, you, when you look at like the Earth Tree and you look at Landel from the, the opening areas, it seems really divine. It seems so godly and prim and perfect, but the moment you get there, that like when everything is just coated in this really sort of bright and um, sort of absorbing yellow, it feels so sick. It's just like, oh, wait a minute. This 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 feels like like something that's not quite right. Um, and that uh, that's something that you don't really get in Dark Souls with Anne Orlando. Anne Orlando is just like the golden, well, the white uh, golden city of the gods, which is like, you know, you, you get the sense that something isn't right there. It's, like, very empty and all that, but that sort of palpable sense of, oh, this is actually a really ugly place uh, never quite hits in. That's a good point. Anne Orlando is perfect from every, like, ex like observable way, unless you mm -hmm. unlock its secret and dispel the illusion. But within yeah. Landel itself, you know, you explore the outer wall battleground before you even get there, and you see the carnage wrecked against it. And then once you get inside of the city, you see the remnants of the ancient dragon moor, Grantzik's stone, immovable body that's been left there since time immemorial. And as you go through it, you see like the lower sections of Landel aren't all golden rooftopped and elitism. You know, there's it's like a burned out ghetto of a place. It's not 
it's not holy or divine, and it's possible that that kind of destruction was wrecked by Lindel's own inhabitants, since the wall, city's walls have never been breached. So there's like much more of that ugliness to it, like you say. There's there's like uh, the two faces of Elden Ring. You know, it focuses much as it focuses much more on always having like the divine good side, and then having that sort of secret ulterior motive, sort of darker side to things. That's always visible when you yeah. Uh, and it comes, it comes kind of naturally with the territory of being open world because, you know, you can actually just create a little tucked away little village there with some, you know, lore item to explain something um, without having to draw as much attention to it like you would have to in uh, more directed gauntlets like in Dark Souls or in Demon Souls even. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't actually consider that as much, but... The, the fact that it's open world allows you to explore each region and legacy dungeon separate. So you have the story of the lit of the region, which is much broader and compels yeah. stories on like the broader like macro level. But then you've got the legacy dungeon, which is more so aligned with what whoever whatever boss of the region you're going to face. Yeah. So uh, speaking of the open world, um. Traversing an entire continent was done incredibly well in Elden Ring, but it's not exactly from Software's first attempt at depicting an entire world. Even back in Demon oh. Souls, you traveled all across Boletaria to different like uh, biomes, different regions that had very different aesthetics. And while Dark Souls 2 attempted that as well, uh, it didn't work out as well. It was, <laughs> you know, Dark Souls 2 is famously uh. hated for its jank and its level design. So. What do you think of how that connects to Elden Ring as an open world? Do you think they learned lessons from those games, or? Uh... Um. So, um, I'm kind of like uh, I'm kind of mixed because I really I think Elden Ring is a really compromised game, but it's also a really great game. Um, and you know, some something like Dark Souls Two, I could I could imagine that approach feeling a lot better if the game had been directed uh and not like if 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 instead of being uh recreated halfway through if that game would have had a much smoother production cycle probably it i i think it would have felt better to me because i prefer that sort of really cramped and tucked away uh level design of dark souls 1 and even yarnum to to a certain extent has it as well Whereas in Elden Ring, you oftentimes have like really big planes of you know just space to navigate through. Um, I kind of lost the thread there. <laughs> Sorry. I get it. That was a pretty broad question. Um, I think uh, like it's it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, the wide open spaces because this is more of a gameplay consideration. Uh, but in Elden Ring and also in sort of Dark Souls Three or Sekiro. There's a much more focus. There's a much larger focus on the actual player combat and how that expands dynamically from just interacting with enemies, and that's sort of yeah. an improvement, obviously, in what they can do game design wise. But it's also somewhat replaced what was previously attempted in Dark Souls One or Demon Souls, where enemies would be in he like an enemy was tied to the level. You know, it mattered more where the enemy was and how many of them attacked you in the level in those earlier games because it was very like very polished and honed in in design whereas like Elden Ring you can just meet packs of people walking around the overworld and then you're fighting a bunch of people on like a flat planescape where there's no walls or drops or environmental hazards yeah. to consider yeah this is a uh, it's kind of like uh, I said earlier that Elden Ring is a great game but it's also a really compromised game I imagine if FromSoft would have had had say like an extra year of development and like fully paid for, I don't think they would have gone with this combat system again. I think the reason we're run we're use reusing the Dark Souls three combat system, just like with more bells and whistles attached, is because um, we have so many assets already available for this system that we can just reuse. Like the basics of enemy AI. We can just reuse that. All these cut enemies from the previous games, we can just repackage that. We can reuse all of that. Or we could spend a lot of money and a lot of resources creating a new combat system for Elden Ring. Which I, I think a different combat system would have made Elden Ring better. But, you know, because like the system they have is a system that was originally designed for a dungeon crawler. And you like 
you export that over to like this gigantic open world and it it just it doesn't mesh for me especially like since the dungeons that we do have say like when you go to the halic tree when you go to lendell um they never or like the volcano manor they never feel quite as tightly directed as uh, a given level in demon souls because um because now the combat system has so much more verticality baked in, meaning they add a jump function, and you can zoom past the actual map arena much faster, and you can do much bigger attacks, so you need more physical space yourself to fight the enemies in, and, like, the, the physical spaces, they get bigger themselves, and it's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I, I would have wanted a new combat system there. That's interesting. I feel like some of what you described with the level design was, uh, you know, like you say compromised and it's like within the scope of what they wanted to make in it like they wanted to make an immersive world where it felt like you were going through what was a level but also a like something that was lived in like a castle like the hassles very much feel like castles the cities feel like cities i'm yeah. interested in what you would want from a gameplay design would you want more like player defensive features would you like uh maybe faster attacks or different types of ashes of war or spells um I'm interested in what you would think would be good to expound on all of this, these systems that they have. Oh, um, so I think the best combat system they've ever designed uh, is in probably Bloodborne, um, because Miyazaki explained that the purpose of the regain mechanic or the rally mechanic is that you're, it's supposed to nudge you into the action more, right? Bloodborne is all about fighting for survival and just by adding the rally mechanic, just by you being able to recover some of your lost health by attacking enemies, um, that you express yourself very naturally like that. So that fighting for your life sensibility that they were going for, it, it comes really clean out just from that mechanic. Um, for Elden Ring, I think you really need to just distill what exactly you are going for with the comp, like, what what is the sense you're trying to uh, articulate with the combat system and design it from that? And um, because if you just like, I don't know, I don't know if you can say that more defensive options would have made it good. Because I don't think, uh, I don't think we're really lacking for any, you know, specific mechanic, right? If you if you build your character right, you can have, you can do basically anything, but. For Elden Ring specifically, because it's an open world game, I think what I would have really liked, and this is probably not possible within the scope of the game, because it is, it's kind of like a Shadow of the Colossus, right? Where, if, what if the player could climb? And what if like you have climbing combat, and now you can kind of just like jump on the walls and stab enemies from different directions like that? Um, yeah, because, like a sort of Breath of the Wild climbing mixed with Dragon's Dogma into like the sort of Soulsy. I can yeah, imagine well, it, that. Yeah, well, it did. Yeah, it it did. It wouldn't even have to be like as liberating as in Breath of the Wild, where you can climb any surface. It could be like you can climb any surface that like you can climb any cobbled surface or any surface with moss on it or something like that. I feel like uh, that would also feed really well into the exploration, where you can just like go up to a castle and. You just have to like actually climb around it and figure out an interesting way in. You'd feel much more like an immersive adventurer, I can tell you that, having to scale castle walls and get around defenses that way rather than finding like the made level designed method of getting in. Yeah. I like that idea. It would also create obstacles in the levels outside of combat. So you can have more quiet time where you're just kind of like shimmying across a rooftop or like a windowsill trying to find your way in. And that kind of pacing is very important, especially the From Software when they design their games. Like, they like to have the players slow down in certain sections or speed up in others. Uh, the sewers beneath Landel being one of the best examples, where it's not only a labyrinthine complex that's overleveled compared to where you are before that, but it's also... Yeah. Uh, once you get to the end of it, it's got a hard boss with a hidden altar behind it with a drop pit that's designed to make you go, screw this, you know? Like, it doesn't <laughs> want you there. That's the feeling they want to make for you. Yeah, I think the subterranean shunning grounds and, like, the whole sewer area is probably the best level in Elden Ring. Would you yeah, agree? Yeah, from a typical Souls standard, I can... I would agree with that. You know, it's one of the most tightly designed. It 
holds to a lot of the old hardcore like damaging and punishing motifs. It's confusing. Yeah. It's got verticality. It feels like it, they could have just cut that section completely out of Lindell and packaged it as a Demon Souls level. You probably like it would probably feel a, a bit weird. It's not quite as um, dungeon crawlery, and it's a bit kind of uh, it's just because it's like a, it's a one it's one giant contained level, whereas Demon Souls always broke them up. But it definitely fe I think feels the most sort of dungeon crawlery, which kind of goes back to well, you have a this you have a combat system built on the back of a dungeon crawler, and you have enemy AI, which is built on the back of a dungeon crawler. So what levels do you think are naturally going to you know become come out the best when you play the game? Well, th the ones that are closer to being dungeon crawlers, because that's what the system excels at. Yeah, it's like uh, it's interesting that you bring up how they reuse Dark Souls 3's engine, because it really has the idea with it that Previously, Dark Souls games were very much designed around what the gameplay would evoke, but at this point where they're working off of such a broad basis of what they've already made, they're sort of reusing the basic gameplay features and they're adding story elements around it to make you feel immersive, but in doing yeah. so, it feels like they lost some of what the core gameplay could have been designed around to evoke the feelings, because it still, like you say, evokes that dungeon crawler feeling. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of the subterranean sh subterranean shunning grounds, uh, what do you think of them as being similar to the depths from Dark Souls 1, where you have the sewer complex beneath Lordran, you know, basically Langdol, um, mm -hmm. and in that sewer complex there are plagued victims who are shunned from normal society and left to be forgotten. And of course, beneath that is the broad Lost Isolith Blight Town place, but the idea is that beneath the sewers is somewhat a source of their affliction, the plague, but then also the flame of chaos, you know? In both cases, you've got the Roach of Isolith, and then you've got the Three Fingers. Um, sort of a very interesting parallel to me. Yeah, well, it, there's another way of looking at it, which is uh, Bloodborne. You know, Yarnum, there's a gigantic just sewer pit there, and deeper below the world still, you have, uh, you have the Thumerian tombs. And it's this, it's this idea that impurities they they are all funneled into this system into like the depths into the subterranean shining grounds uh, or into like the sewer in bloodborne and you just you move them out because you can't have the impurities in your town you have to put them somewhere else but where do you put them do you just like if, if you if you don't like if you can't exterminate them you kind of just dump them into blight town and then that's like you have the golden city of the gods on the mountain cliff then you have the human world of Undead Burke, and beneath that you have the Depths, and beneath that you have Blight Town. And it's just like, it gets progressively more and more impure as you go further down. Yes, and we see that sort of uh, most clearly defined in Sekiro, where it's very much a game about the flowing waters of Ashina, and how they, mm -hmm. they, gr they flow from the divine dragon within the divine realm. Uh, and the Fountainhead Palace is built at the foot of the Divine Realm, so much so that it's somewhat part of it in a nebulous sense. And from that, you know, it flows to Ashina. And all the way down yeah. to the Sunken Valley, where it accumulates into those poison pools, because it doesn't purify completely. All it does is cleanse and take those uh, diseases and curses away, and they pool in uh, elsewhere. And I mean, that that has been used in, I think, pretty much every Souls game. You've got the Valley of Defilement, you've got Blight Town, you've got the place where the Rotten is in Dark Souls 2. I don't remember the name. Um, uh. Feren Swamp is sort of that method. And it's yeah. very interesting to me. I feel like, because the vibe of cleansing but not purifying is definitely used again in... Elden Ring, with uh, Millennia's Scarlet yeah. Rot being a prime example, but the Omen and Scarlet Rotted Elbenorix being somewhat lesser parts of the same whole. Yeah. It's all that, uh, it's that, it's that whole idea of Keikare, which uh, <clears throat> I've talked about so many times. Ooh, would, would you mind if I asked you to talk about it one more time? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's no problem. Have you read about Keikare? Honestly, I'm not sure if I have. I'm assuming it's a Japanese concept. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
it's it it kegare basically just means impurity but it can also mean corruption and these two words aren't really good for describing it but they're the best words that we have so the basic idea and this is like what the games are about like big picture too the basic idea is that um there is a natural orderly good harmonious relationship with things in the world but once the boundaries that enforce that sort of harmonious relationship or order, once those boundaries become muted, they they allow for forces to reshape those boundaries, kind of like just the Elden Ring itself. You know, the Elden Ring exists and it dominates the order of the world, but the Elden Ring can be changed. So the order of the world changes. Um, but for Kagare specifically, um, it's it's really good to think about it in terms of like flowing water, where and I know it's it's it kind of it kind of sounds a bit chaotic because jumping between this stuff, but Kegare is a spiritual idea, right? So it it has physical properties, but it also has like socio social uh, properties and physical properties. So if you have just a body of water, and um, yeah, yeah, you have you have a waterfall, and that waterfall creates a river, and that river runs through the land, and it picks up all the impurities in the land. And it moves them away, and this allows for um, this allows for life to flourish, right? Trees and all these different kinds of ecosystems of animals they they habit it around the flowing water, but eventually the water stops moving, right? You enter a lake, which is just like a still body of water, and what happens there is that um, parasites they hatch their eggs there, right? Because the waters are still, so the eggs won't be swept away in the river, and uh, impurities, they just kind of get dumped into this pool of stagnant water. And so the water, in, instead of becoming a purifying agent, it becomes like a seedbed of rot. And the idea with Kegare is that if you touch the water, you, you, in, you inherit that sort of spiritual impurity on your body. And you need to wash yourself. You need to go through some sort of cleansing uh, ritual in order to become clean again. Another, but like, it, it's not just flowing water, right? So if you, if you find a dead animal or a dead person, um, that person, like that, that corpse is also a seedbed of impurity. Like, and if you touch them, you can also get kegare that way. And it kind of, it, it follows you and it's kind of like, it's kind of like um, gum on your shoe. It's just like, it, it's stuck to you until you can remove it. And the reason like a corpse would give you kegare is because like, um, like blood, Blood is pure when it's inside the body. Feces are pure when they're inside the body. But once that boundary is crossed, it becomes impure. Which is like why childbirth, for example, is impure and you need to be really quick and orderly about like cleaning that whole thing up and doing all the proper rituals and such. And for society, for example, like if the emperor dies, you need to be really quick about finding the new emperor. Because the, the longer that sort of opening is, the more um, impure forces are able to enter that void to, to sort of try to reshape it into something else. Um, you can see this in, Elden, uh, in Dark Souls, for example, with, you know, you have, the, you have the way of the world, right? It's fire, and then the fire goes out, and it becomes the world of darkness. But Gwyn says, no, I don't want that to happen, and he, he stagnates that sort of flow of time. And instead of uh, a graceful, like, natural, orderly way of the world, uh, we get stuck in a prolonged age of fire long past the time where this order can actually sustain the world and everything begins to stagnate and corrupt itself. In Sekiro, like, the, the world design is literally just that flowing body of water where the dragon on top, like, even the dragon on top is impure because uh, the immortality was severed from the dragon without its consent. So the water that runs down from Fountainhead it has that element of impurity to it. Um, and you can see this also in, like, uh, in, in, in Bloodborne, for example. That's a great example of it, where you have uh, the, the healing church and the, and the blood of the healing church, where the blood makes your physical properties, like your body, becomes malleable. The actual boundaries that organize, like, that confine you you can sort of lift those boundaries and evolve into something else, but if you if you can't um, if you can't guide the process, you just become like this horrible uh, horrible beast, right? And in Elden Ring, you have that 
same idea expressed as in Dark Souls, where you have like, here's the order of the world, it's the Elden Ring. And then you have people going in there and being like, ooh, you know, I don't like death. I'm going to take that part out. But like the world, like that's, that's kind of a part of the world. And now the world figures out a way to express itself without death. And you get all of these corrupting agents of the world uh, to fill the void. I actually have this theory uh, because I haven't like on to, uh, uh, to like full discretion. I haven't researched Elden Ring nearly as much as the other games. Um, so maybe you can actually help me here. Do we know like when the first instance of Scarlet Rot uh, in the history of Elden Ring emerges? Um, if I had to set a clear definition to it, I would say that it would have started with the goddess of Rot. And if we understand the gods as bearing great runes or it, uh, adhering to the power of the greater will, you could then possibly place it sometime within the prehistory age out of all four ages presented in Elden Ring. And within that prehistory uh. age, I would you would place it uh, after the ancient dragon's rule, as and also after the greater will descends upon the lands between to give people the power of great runes. So I would say sometime then, but then she would have been sealed away by the dancer in blue um, before the prehistory yeah. ends. Or yeah, yeah, and and the dancer in blue, like that's again that idea of a moving river. Yeah, Whereas Scarlet I've Roth is like this. Fairy, uh... Yeah. <laughs> you can go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Scarlet Roth is just like this seedbed of impurity and uh, and uncleanliness and rot and stagnation. Yeah, the, the Scarlet Roth yeah. very much represents the stagnation of being. And, you know, it's represented through swamps in both of the areas you go to. And you even see yeah. within the Halleague tree itself how the water that was once flowing purely has now turned into uh, scarlet rot. You know, it's poisonous now. Um, yeah. And that's, uh, that's why it's so important that the mentor who taught Melania how to control it, he, had, he, was, the, he was the warrior of that moving lake, like the Siofra River, I believe. Uh, wasn't he from there or somewhere? Yes, I've seen uh, people say that the Blue Fairy, I think this was Little Church lore on Twitter, but the Blue Fairy in many Celtic myths represents a river in its concepts, like blue being associated with uh, water. So yeah, given and, and you Siofra find... being, uh, being like Gaelic or Celtic for fairy. Exactly. I think I've seen it pronounced yeah. Shifra as well, if you're getting into like Gaelic and Irish pronunciations, but I mean, Siofra <laughs> is how I said it for a very long time. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's fascinating so, yeah. with the concept of Kegere. I, uh, I never really knew that, but it, it really fits with all of the design philosophies within the game. Like, even the Divine Dragon, you say it's impure, and you could read that impurity as being the Divine Dragon was once part of the Divine Realm, once within the whole, but now it's gone beyond the, the boundaries. It's now impure as a result. I, uh, that's yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah, and and like uh, the 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 heir to the dragon's legacy. Like, first of all, the dragon's legacy was kind of stolen from the dragon. Um, the the sword we get, the the gracious gift of tears. Uh, it's actually gracious tears, or something like that. It doesn't have like it like in the English translation. There's this connotation of oh, it was graciously given, but in the Japanese version, it means like no, 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 no. It was graciously accepted or taken, so you don't you don't quite have that clash of like of uh, that sort of clash of, you know, what I don't know what I'm trying to say. You're tr I'm trying to say, um, it's not it's not so obvious that this was um, that this was the dragon's decision. Yeah, so the, and, um, uh, within the Japanese version, it seems to imply that the dragon had the tears taken, its power of immortality, whereas in the English, when it says gracious gift, it's like the dragon graciously yeah. bestowed its immortality upon humanity, which isn't exactly the case. Yeah, yeah. And like the Kegare, like death is a seedbed of Kegare. When you die in Sekiro, you, how do you resurrect? You resurrect by spreading dragon rot, right? You, and dragon rot is not actually a disease. What dragon rot is, is like you're leeching off of the life force of the living creatures around you. Yeah, that's you're Kegare. stagnating their blood, because your blood has yeah. lost its vitality. And that sort of goes back to, I feel like, the blood echoes in Bloodborne, where blood has a willpower, it has a vitality to it. 
So in yeah. Sekiro, you you have vitality. That vitality is what supports your rebirth. And when you run out of it, you take it from other people, which makes them rot. In Bloodborne, yeah. you know, you have the will of the blood, and it's a power you can make your own. And it's sort of, yeah, yeah. I find Kagari like to be um... very uh, interesting overall. It's um, it's like a karmic and spiritual way of seeing actual disease and social issues arise, like. Uh, within the yeah. terms of the emperor being displaced and how it's important that you find a new emperor, that's actually somewhat directly translatable to Elden Ring, where the Shattering War is uh, a stagnant age of impurity that's due to there being no ruler. There is no Elden Lord, and Queen Merica, the goddess of the land, has disappeared. There's no ruler, it's just a vacant seat. Yeah. You see this also in, like, in Dark Souls, where... Uh, the order of the world demands a monarch, somebody to sit on top of the world to, like, organize it. And, like, in Dark Souls 3, you see it in, like, Aldrich and Garbage people like that, where it's like, the world doesn't care who sits on the throne. You just need somebody to do it. Because uh, once, if you have the throne, like, you have in Elden Ring, like, you have Margot, the, uh, the Omen King, but, like, if the throne is empty then power flows out of the throne and it just sort of, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't centralize in anybody's hands. So you get people like Rikard, who's like the Lord of Treachery. And he's like trying to express Merica's wish of make of yourself what you wish and like challenge the, the, the order. And it's like, yeah, but, but is Rikard any better than like the stagnation that's occurring because we don't have a, have an Elden Lord? And so eventually it's like you get the Ashen One or you get the Tarnished. You get like these these people emerge seemingly just created by the universe itself, right? If you um, subscribe to the theory that in the beginning of Elden Ring that we're actually being birthed or like created uh, in the Earth Tree itself, like through an Earth Tree burial. Um, I don't know if you subscribe to that theory or not, but if you do, you kind of get the sense of the the world has waited for so long for somebody to take up the, like the reins of power that it just goes like screw it I'm gonna create my own guy and it just like that's your player character. That's a deeply fascinating view on it. I feel like I'm not entirely sold on the idea that the uh, the warrior, the hero tarnished is from like birthed within the earth tree. But uh, I really like that you bring up the throne ideas like. Uh, you really see how the Lords of Cinder, uh, like, you see how it goes from Dark Souls 1, where King Gwyn is the Lord of Cinder, and the only Lord of Cinder that stagnated the Age, and you can either rekindle it and rule your own Age of Fire, or you can usher in the Age of Dark. But when they, they stick with the idea of the cycles, then they have to re they have to reimagine the idea of lordship. What does it mean to be a lord of cinder? And that's where you get the throne of wants. Like the throne of wants is the seat for the most powerful being in the land. And that's where you get, you know, what is the mark of a true lord? It's strength. You know, you see like developments of this idea through the course of the Souls trilogy and how they handle the idea of being a lord of cinder. Because at the very end in three, they represent it through sacrifice. Like you yeah. have the strength to be the most powerful being in the world, but what is it to be Lord? Well, it, it, it's just a sacrifice. And you see that in the Elden Ring again, with how the Elden Lords are treated as disposable. Like, you have this yeah. idea and of... and your maiden. Oh, yeah, the Firekeeper and the, the Knight and the Champion is, like, the archetype of... Yeah. That's such a favorite archetype of them. Yeah, and I love, I love Vike. I think Vike is possibly my favorite character in Elden Ring because he's he's um um he's just like this guy he like FromSoft loves to do this idea of repeating narratives in their games so like if you've ever wondered why Lawrence and Mikolash from Bloodborne have the exact same backstory and are trying to do the exact same thing well it's because they used to be the same person but then FromSoft they wanted to they wanted to take the character into two different directions so they went Let's just make it two characters. Uh, and they do this a lot. There's like, um, in, in, even back in Kingsfield, like way before Miyazaki, you have like, uh, like in Kingsfield 2, you have King Harvine, who's like this old king from long, long ago. Uh, and you can sort of, you can kind of in the periphery of the world see his old exploits and you can kind of contrast and compare them to your own exploits. So this idea of like, 
the same story happening on different scales in the world um, continues to repeat. And oh, I lost the I lost the thread again. What was I talking about? What were we talking about? <laughs> I in Elden think you were, I think it, you were driving right. towards the cyclical aspects of souls repeating stories by like in expounding yeah. on one story by having it echoed in another. You know, like Bloodborne has the Thumero uh, original like like city of the gods and the vampires but then you've also got loran after that and then you've got yarnum after that and they all f undergo like the same sort of transformative process and either evolve well, or I, evolve but i i would actually argue that uh loran came before yarnum um i would accept and, uh, that <laughs> <laughs> was because it's like lost to the sands and stuff and like yarnum is built on the top of thumaru and uh you even have like in in bloodborne itself you have like Lauren and Ys. One land, like, went for ascension to godhood and became filled with beasts and depravity and it collapsed. But the other one, the other one, Ys, was able to actually transcend and reach the cosmos. And that sort of divide you see again in Willem and Lawrence. And then you see it in, like, Bergenworth and the Healing Church. And then the Healing Church itself splits off into the choir, which wants ascension, and you, which is like the Ys faction, and Mensis, which is like the Loran faction, and like East has the has the uh, has the East Chalice. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, the Choir has the East Chalice, and Mensis has the Loran Chalice. So it's like this whole like this split is just like repeating on cycle and cycle and cycle forever in this universe, seemingly. And in Elden Ring, this is why I think Vike is so cool. Is because Vike is the protagonist. Except he 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 didn't have it in him to uh, to uh, burn his maiden, and he's just like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's so cool. It is very cool. I, like we were saying earlier, Elden Ring makes the player much more front and center and within the narrative, but it also gives them rivals, which I adore. Um, like yeah. you know, like front and center within, who, like the guy still alive is Gideon Ofnir, the leader of the Round Table Hold, the one who's got an audience with the two fingers before you, and who is expected to become Lord until you come along. And the reason he hasn't yet is because he's like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna be all knowing." But before that, you have Vike, like you say, and you have Bernal, and they're both different spectrums of how they react to reaching Flame Peak and seeing that dilemma with the Maiden. Like, Vike chooses yeah. to uh, try and, like, you know, he, he treads the path of true rigor, as Shabriri calls it, and he's like, well, I'm gonna try and contain the flame. He's very much the Ivory King, you know, trying to contain the Chaos Flame, but failing and coming to embody it. But then you have yeah. Bernal, who's like, he goes on to Feramazula, and he lets his maiden burn himself herself, but then he falls to nihilism. It's no longer worth it to become lord. What's he fighting for? So he joins Rikard. Like, it's it's fascinating. Yeah, that's, um, that's definitely a, a from softwareism where it's like, um, the different like the different aspects of the of the cosmology and of like the, the fantasy universes they're all expressed with these different characters so like do you do you do you kindle the flame or do you let it die out but what if you do neither what if you just kind of like sit back and watch what happens well that's aldrich that's aldrich that's aldrich that's like Oh yeah, he's just like sitting it out, waiting in his own corner. He like has dreams of the dark age, and he like there's I think there's a line that talks about how he loves to uh, submerge himself in still water, which goes back into like Kegare and how like he's like the he's the king of impurity because he his age is not an age of fire, it's not an age of dark, it's an age of the deep, right? Of the rotting seedbed of impurity that it, that lives in deep waters deep still waters and he just wants the stagnant rot to continue forever um and like you said like with bernal or uh, or vike you have there are these different ways in which the world can go and we we can't actually show that to you right you can't make the decision to not burn your firekeeper because like the story has to happen but it's an important decision, so let's look at the ramifications of making that decision. Here's Mike. Yeah, it's storytelling through demonstration, in one of the like most perfect ways I could imagine. You learn more about what you could possibly do 
through it seeing what others have done. And like, I mean, even in Dark Souls 1, you, the player, is seeing what Gwyn has done. It's what leads you to your own decision, even if it's not a decision because you're playing a game and it's on rails, you know? it's mm -hmm. It makes you ponder in the best way possible. Yeah. It's interesting you brought up Aldrich, because Aldrich actually, I feel like he connects to, um, to Elden Ring in two sort of the major ways. The first being he his character concept as someone who fell to his own gluttony, his greed and obsession with uh, devouring things made him eventually uh, his form fell to a pile of sludge and he became that like sludge pile we see. That idea of being devoured by your own greed is something that's repeated in Elden Ring with Rikard. He, uh, on the moments of being devoured by the Great Serpent, something he willingly did to suit his own ambition, he has this vision of devouring the gods. And yeah. on the moment that Aldrich transformed into the sludge pile, he, uh, he had this vision of the age of the deep, of like the deep abyss that would overtake all the world, you know? And that sort of sets up both of the goals after their transformation. How, uh, how good is your Dune game? <laughs> it's my favorite book series, so very good. Okay, you've, you've, <laughs> okay. I think Rikard, because we know that... Um, the Carthus sandworm, right? We know that Halleck, uh, which is Yorm, uh, used to be like a character in do in uh, Dark Souls Three, but they shuffled it around and changed his name. I think Rikard is like, what if the God Emperor of Dune was a character? Because like, if you look at it, he's like, he looks kind of like the God Emperor, right? He's got like the face, and he's got like the serpentine worm body, and like he's got two hands. And what does he do? He has like. Like, the God Emperor of Dune has, like, the golden path where he's gonna impose tyranny and cruelty upon humanity in order to breathe within the very DNA of humanity the desire to be free, to be, you know, to free themselves from this. And Rikard's kind of like, well, what if we had a character kind of like this, who voluntarily goes through this horrific transformation in order to become something that's able to overcome the order of the world? But with Rikard, it's like... Okay, and also, he's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually very much believe the possibility that Rikard, in his method of transforming into the serpent, is similar to like how Leto takes the, uh, the little makers into his flesh, and that begins the transformation. Yeah. And especially within the design, the way that his face is on the snake, like it really echoes Dune 4 covers, where you see the big human face on like the the worm body, like I, uh, I'm very with that, and I also think that Merica may be inspired by um, by Leto in sort of personality. Like if you read, uh, like in Dune Four is basically Leto plotting his own death. You know, he's allowing yeah. things, you know, plot machinations to go, and he's letting it sort of happen without knowing the full breadth of it. So I feel like Merica echoes that in some way as she shatters the Elden Ring expecting her own sort of sentence into being the vessel of the Elden Ring rather than the queen goddess within. So she's going to be trapped within the Erda Tree forevermore, most likely. Similar to how L Lado, after his own death, becomes the, uh, the worms of the next age so that he can continue to guide humanity. R Merica yeah. still is the vessel of the Elden Ring. She still guides it. Uh, yeah, but uh, but uh, but the but the worms are no longer Shai Halud. It's become Shai Hatan, and it's no longer a god. It's a demon. Yeah, she has her nature rewritten, and Leto is villainized after his yeah. descent. You know, he goes from god emperor to villainized demon. Merica goes from god queen to villainized uh, villain. You know, like. Yeah. And even the Golden Order, you know, like, the Golden Order to ensure humanity's, uh, like, well-being. The Golden Path to ensure humanity's yeah. well-being. Yeah. Precisely. And, like, you have the Golden Path visually in, like, uh, the, uh, the Rune Embers, right? Like, that Grace of Guidance, or whatever it's called. Like, Golden Guidance, or whatever it's called. I mean, like, I saw that, and I was like, is that 
that can't be. That's like that's too specific. I'm 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 I want this to be real. I'm reading this into it to be real, but I don't think that's like I don't <laughs> think that's a golden path for real. <laughs> it's a little bit of a stretch, but I can see the heart in it. I admire I admire it, even if it's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um and with uh with Dune and like Rikard, you see like Rikard for all of his like for 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 however corrupted and evil he may be, he was he was like a true believer in his mission of uh, overcoming the order of the world. Like Rani gave him the uh, the stone to overcome Malekith in case she no not not Rani um um it was uh, the Bolmite queen oh. was it Rani? Yes, it, it, when she stole yeah. death, she marked a, a fragment of it onto the stone, so he might be able to challenge Malekith and be able to parry his like powerful attacks that channeled destined death. Yeah, yeah. Um, of so course, like, Rani so like... gave that to him before he transformed. Like she didn't expect that out of him, and that was one of like the like after his transformation, it became impossible for him to use the stone and to challenge Malekith because uh. he's just a big snake hiding in a cavern at that point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't know that. I thought that um, I just assumed that his transformation had happened prior to that. But no, it probably makes more sense if she gave him the stone while he was still like humanoid. Yeah, I um. Well, I mean, this is somewhat head canon, but somewhat me assuming motivations. Uh, because like you know, it, I've written a fan fiction about it, so it's sort of like <laughs> in my mind, I'm worried that I've gotten my own head canons mixed up with like, <laughs> reality. <laughs> but essentially, my take on it was that at the beginning of the Shattering War, Rikard withdrew with his knights to his own keep and lands. Uh, he didn't want to like partake in the war that all of the Tarnished were being called back for, that his own brother Radan was gearing up for, because he saw it as the greater will pitting them against each other in a sort of like, he didn't want to be pathetic and follow those rules. So he chose to be above it by like being, be, like it's pride, you know? Yeah. So that pride continues, and he uses his power and his knights to gain power. Like, he goes around probably, like, taking uh, money, like, from peasants, from elites, you know, he's just taking everything he can to amass the power he needs to rise against the gods. But it's not enough, you know, Radan is pushed back from Landol, he goes to Stormvale to attack Godric, and then he goes back to his own Redmain Keep. And Morgat becomes the Veiled King, and Morgat leads his armies against Gelmir, and that's when Rikard realizes that his strength will never be enough. You know, he's already been given the Blasphemous Claw by Rani, who made it during the Night of the Black Knives, but at mm -hmm. this point he's like, I can't even get to Malekith, I can't even take Landol, what's the point? I need more strength. And at this point, he's had the great rune for so long that his philosophies are being corrupted by the rune that he bears. His ambition and greed are being inflamed. Uh, I'm not sure if you buy into this theory, but there's a possibility that all of the great runes belonged to gods during the prehistory that were uh, taken out by Godfrey, and then those great runes were added to the Elden Ring. That's what Rajir talks about when he says that the Elden Ring used to be malleable and it used to be able to have more things added to it. So if you assume mm -hmm. that Rikard's great rune was once the original serpent gods, the great serpent, when it became a god, would have had that great rune, then it makes sense that he would, uh, through his ambition and greed, be driven to reconjoin with it by letting it eat him, and it devours him and his great rune, and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And we also see uh, in uh, Malekith's Bath's room uh, an older version of the Elden Ring, which does look very, very different. Yes, it does. It's uh, that one gives that one keeps me up at night because it's like if the Elden Beast wasn't an Elden Ring until the Golden Order, then any depiction of the Elden Beast or the Elden Ring in the prehistory would have been in some ways a metaphysical depiction rather than a physical one because the Elden Ring wasn't forged into a ring. But then it's. it's so many things going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's almost like they might have changed their minds about what they wanted to do with this story halfway through. <laughs> now, I have this theory. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, I have this theory that the Bloodborne we got is actually not one Bloodborne. It's actually the beginning of one Bloodborne and the end of another Bloodborne. Right? That these are two different builds that have sort of just been glued together at the end. 
because um yeah I, I i don't know if we should uh devote a lot of time to that that could be like a 20 minute topic on its own but <laughs> maybe you have, i'll like... have to have you on again sometime to talk about how Lawrence oh, definitely. and Mika Lash got split up <laughs> definitely it's just like the wild inane theories <laughs> I mean, they're most suited for podcasts where you don't have to stay as truly, like, stay as focused on saying the absolute truth and everything. So, I think oh, that's, that's true. Good. That's true. Uh, but uh, you have uh, back to the topic of like um, of uh, things being reused. You brought up Morgoth. Morgoth is Gwendolyn. Very it's much Gwendolyn. Of, yeah, it's the it's that sort of unwanted, disposed of son who throughout it all, rises to become, like, the truest, most ardent defender of the prevailing order, even though the order disposed of him. Yeah, in both cases, like, they're unfit for lordship from the popular view. Um, yeah. Gwendolyn, because he's a, like, fanboy, and then Morgat because he's, um... <laughs> Morgat because he's an omen. Um... And because of that, they they rule the land of the gods from the shadows. Morgat is the veiled king. He doesn't have anyone seek audience with him, and no one even knows Gwendolyn exists. You know, he he sits in the tomb of his dad all day, being pouty, and he has the illusion of Guinevere set up to make everyone feel like things are legit. You know, it's uh, yeah. Morgat even hides his identity with Margit and everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. How do you feel and about a... Nicola as Gwendolyn, as someone who inherits Gwendolyn's sort of gender-bent nature and his uh, sort of absolute authority? You know, Gwendolyn speaks as a god, he commands things as a god. I feel like Nicola very much has that loyalty in his soldiers. Uh, what, have you, have you yeah. read into that at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, the, the story of Dark Souls is like the story of Gwyn. It's like the story of... Um, the prevailing order of the world sort of breaking down. And you see in Gwyn's kids, he has, like, the Nameless King, who's, like, the most masculine character in the entire series. Then he has Gwendolyn, who's, like, the most feminine character. Like, the these are just, like, the archetypical depictions of masculinity and femininity. And then you have Gwendolyn, and it's like, well, wait a minute. This, like, the boundaries have been broken here. What's going on? And very much in the same way, you have uh, the children of the gods in Elden Ring. You have, like, like Godfrey keeps having these omen kids, almost like you know he's he 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 isn't he isn't fit to be Elden Lord anymore. He creates like he has a, a, a Godwin, and Godwin by all accounts is like, oh, this is the guy. This is like the guy we want. But then he's like Morgoth and Moak, and it's like, ugh, this guy like he can't create uh, worthy heirs anymore. And then it's like he's thrown out, and she brings in uh, Radagon. But then like Radagon. It's like you get Mikola and Melania at the end, which is like they they're also kind of broken in different ways. So it's like it's it's not that the men in uh, in America's life are not capable of like it may not be that they are personally not capable of creating kids that fit within this boundary anymore. It may be that like America's own uh like because she like she shatters the Elden Ring. She doesn't like she she doesn't fully recognize it as uh, the supreme force of the world, and she has like ambitions of remolding it and changing it. And I think that may be that like that's kind of why um, forces like the god goddess of Scarlet Rot is able to sort of flow into this uh, into this order and infest Melania. And that's kind of like why Mikola. Um, Mikola becomes like this idealized child well into adulthood where like he, he Mikola doesn't grow up right because like the the boundary of the world is broken and because you haven't mended it for so long these different forces have been able to flow into it and now it's uh th things are being expressed within the world that don't necessarily confine with how the world you be you believe it to be uh, operate yeah, um, I think Enya has a quote where she says the corruption of the Order has taken its toll. And I yeah. think, you know, it's in reference to how the Order has degenerated over time, how the heirs to America have never been fit. You know, Godric has his line where he talks to the dragon and he's like, thou art a worthy heir. 
And the entire question of the Shattering War is who is the worthy heir of Radigan and Merica? Like, who is fit to succeed them? And so the demigods go to war to decide. But obviously, yeah. none of them are. And like Merica says, if you want to be, you know, think of yourself as you will, a, be it a god or a lord. But if you fail to become aught at all, you'll become sacrifices to the would be lord, the tarnished that will come after, you know? Yeah. Um? It's funny you bring up uh, Godwin and the Nameless King, because there's, uh, I think one of the coolest parallels is in them. You know, when I first found out about Godwin, I was like, oh, it's the Nameless King, but like his dragon mm -hmm. love was accepted for once. Wow. You know, it's not, we went from <laughs> hunting ancient dragons to loving them. You know, I'm with it. Uh, <laughs> like Lanciax went into human form. Like there was very much like a, an acceptance there, but yeah. After that acceptance, after that sort of subversion of the hunting dragons trope, we see the same concept of losing, of loss of identity. The nameless king, after he was banished from Anorlando, he was uh, written out of history. He became the nameless king. No one knew his name, his identity, his place in history. And when Godwin dies during the Night of the Black Knives, he has his soul obliterated, his soul being the immortal essence of his being, his identity. Like, it looks like his face is, like, carved off and he's grown a new one that's, like, now the Prince of Undeath's face. He's, he's warped. Yeah. So, um, uh, I think, uh, again, you have, like, uh, this idea of, like, Kegare, where the physical and the spiritual, there's, like, a harmonious relationship. And once you mess with it, things go crazy. So, like, he, he becomes a gigantic, weird fish mermaid man. And um, I, I'm wondering, which is your favorite ending? Uh, I'm sort of torn on it. Personally, I, I'm honestly sort of America apologist. And, you know, I, I like Muriel's quote where he's like, believe in the golden order that blessings will flourish again. So, like, I'm very much a perfect order type of person, like... Repair the great runes and amending philosophy that solves the Elden Ring's dilemma. But yeah. I, I mean, I don't think it's a perfect and lasting piece. But like, none of the endings are very much ideal in their own purest sense. Like, the Age of the Duskborn is basically executing what Merica wants, in my opinion. And the Frenzied Flame is definitely like not good. Um, same with the Fell Curse. But then, like, Ronnie's ending has a lot of arguments for it. But there's a lot of arguments against it. It's very much the Age of Dark ending from Dark Souls 1. Like, do you believe the Age of Dark, the Age of Man, will be good? Or do you believe that people will turn into dark wraiths and go and hunt each other ad infinitum? <laughs> do you believe in Ulysseal? <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of Ulysseal? <laughs> I like that. That's a good answer to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, you're like, Maybe Ulazil wouldn't have happened if uh, the natural expression of the Dark Souls was Dark Soul wasn't being suppressed by uh, Gwyn. And it's like, yeah, but you know, maybe it would have happened. And like, do we want to take that chance? It's like, yeah, it's uh, that's that's also so cool about Elden Ring is that all these different endings. Um, it's not just like you know, Dark Souls has two endings. The Dark Souls games, they have two endings. There's like, you know, the third one has like a few branches here and there. But like in Elden Ring, every ending seems to be like a very different approach to solving the like central dilemma. And um, to like, to put Godwin, uh, to put his rune back into uh, the Elden Ring and be like, no, we're going to put death back into this. And now Godwin can like become the god of death for real, for real. Uh, but it's like... But like, like there should just be like, there's something like, like there's there's something that feels wrong about using his like living corpse to, to try to fix the golden order. <laughs> no, I I'm in full agreement with that. I actually, I think the age of the duskborn it goes a bit beyond the scope of this episode, but it's such an interesting thing because it's like. The Age of the Duskborn is formed when you reunite, bo reunite both Hallowbrands of Undeath and allow J Fia to take them and uh, combine them. Yeah. And then you can take that and reincorporate it to the Order. And that will lead to the Prince of Undeath being able to rise again. 
And there's yeah. a quote that all of the mausoleums, like the soulless demigods, they await a ri- revival. So if you were to incorporate undeath within the order, they would probably revive as well. So in essence, Merica would repair the entire Night of the Black Knives because all of the people killed by it would become undead. But like you say, there's this really, really sort of gross aspect to that where they're undead, their identities are gone. Um, if you look into Undeath from Rajir's point of view, it echoes something of the long dark of the abyss. It's a very deep and peaceful feeling. It numbs all emotion, which for Rajir is something he seeks out. He wants to be embraced by Fia so he can forget his pain. But like, yeah. obviously that's not for everyone. Like, is it right to incorporate death into life in that way when it will do what it does to the Erd tree or when it will do what it does to the world. And also, like I said before, I think the Age of the Duskborn is what Merica wants. If you imagine the Night of the Black Knives as not being originally an act of violence, if you imagine that the reason the Hallowbrands of the Undeath are broken apart as being because Rani killed her flesh at the same time that Godwin died in soul, it mm. you can imagine Godwin, if Rani hadn't done that, then Godwin would have died a true death in soul and body. But then the Hallowbrand would have been instantly formed. It wouldn't have had to be reformed by the Tarnished. It would be together from the get-go. And in that sense, yeah. you can imagine Godwin is rising again. And if Merica's behind that plot, that may have been her intention. That she could start an Age of the Duskborn to avoid the Shattering, rather than ensure it by killing all of uh, her demigod children when she realizes that Godwin's ritual didn't work, you know? Yeah. Have you ever um uh, have you ever taken a close look at the uh the image of the Halibrands? I have, and that's something that definitely comes from Dark Souls. It's the eclipse. And I mean Dark Souls 3 is all about the eclipse, baby. Like <laughs> Yeah. But but there's something else. The centipede. There's centipedes. Yes. The yeah. centipede of and immortality. Centipedes, centipedes, they're they're Mukade. And Mukade, they're born from impurity. That makes sense. That yeah, I mean the yeah. centipedes are the infestation within Sekiro that causes immortality and I mean in even Bloodborne, in Elden Ring. Oh go on. The vermin. The yeah, vermin in, from Bloodborne. Yes, that's a perfect Yeah, example. the the item description uh, explicitly states that vermin are born of the impurity of mankind or something like that. So you're like you look at this rune and you're like this thing doesn't like Oh, I don't know about this. Like, it, I know what it's made from. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's interesting uh, about the fact that the eclipse has that centipede motif? It's um, the Golden Order fundamentalists. They use the golden centipede as a fetish, representing their worship of the Golden Order and Merica. But that centipede actively represents the thing they hate on death, like a union of <laughs> tropes. Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. I think it's so interesting that like uh, you, this this act of shattering the boundary of physical and spiritual life manifests as a centipede which is like because it's an impure act because like you're 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 separating the holy boundary but uh yeah 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 um you're you're eclipsing the holy sun i, I like yeah. that idea we'll be right back after these announcements The content creator Saint Trina, not to be confused with Mikola's alter ego of the same name, is releasing her Elden Ring Pangea theory this Thursday on the 12th. Go give her a follow on Twitter and check out what she has to say. The Dark Souls 3 Arch Thrones modding project has released a new trailer featuring multiple levels from their current work. It's an incredible mesh of animation and level design from every game in the series being ported to DS3 to create a love letter to the developers for making such an awesome game series. Links below. Do you too wish to be all-knowing? Are you a provincial tarnished seeking new meaning in life? Do you long for an invitation to the round table hold? Well, you're in luck because the leader of the hold, Gideon Ofnir, it's taking applications for newly opened positions. Previously held by an assortment of low-life commoners, these positions were opened up by Ofnia's very own daughter, Nephili Lu. 
when she literally killed all of them. Work requirements include, but are not limited to, seeking out new information, slaying the miscreant demigods, making tea for Enya, whispering about how cool Ensha is where she can overhear you, and massacring helpless Elbonorix. If you feel like you're the right fit, call 1-800-TARNISH. Finally, I, Gideon the Half-Knowing, the YouTuber, have finally finished my Elden Ring New Game Plus 10 Let's Play. The finale episodes will, re will release over the next two months and cover much of the endgame of Elden Ring, including strategies on how to beat certain bosses and lore discoveries about the game as a whole. Perfect for putting on in the background while you do your own gaming. Now let's get back to the episode. Another, uh, getting into the undeath and the idea of holiness and uh, like unholiness both stemming from the same source, we have Fia as an echo of the Queen of the Vile Bloods, Annalise, where she is someone that's hated by modern society, by the church specifically. In uh, Annalise's mm -hmm. case, she's attacked by the healing church's executioners. In Fia's case, it's the Golden Order Fundamentalists. And in both cases, those fanatic groups worship this. You know, they worship Merica or they worship the Holy Old Blood. But yeah. they disdain Fia and Annalise. Annalise because she has the Vile Blood. But we know that the Vile Blood is in some ways connected to Yarn and herself. So in some ways, Annalise is the most holy of things, not an unholy thing. And I think yeah, you see well, that again. Oh, go on. You probably know Bloodborne yeah, I, better than I do. I, I was just going to say, like, the, the vile bloods, the reason they look like vampires is because they've had the blood for longer than the Yarnamites have, because Lawrence came there with the blood, and he reawakened their old uh, Thumerian, like, traits earlier. So, like, they all look like these really sunken eyes, gothic-esque vampires, because that's what they used to look like back when, like, the Kanehurst, uh Yarnum uh, split happened back in the old world of Thumaru. And, like, this idea of uh, um, the two factions that hate each other actually having, like, the same origin, you also see that in Demon Souls, in the old one, which is, like, mana powers both magic, uh, like, sorceries and faith, like, miracles. But it's, like, it's the same thing. And it, it both arises from the old one. Yeah, and Frank even has, like, he used to be a priest, but when he learned of the higher knowledge of prayers and sorceries together, he became a sorcerer to unlock that knowledge. And, like, you know, it's his penultimate yeah. discovery, what you said, that they both stem from the old one. Yeah. That's, uh... It's like, when the <laughs> old one so came cool. to be, the, uh, the reality, like, the, the, your ability to impact reality became heightened. Yeah, you were so able you have, to like, use the magic power and of your soul and stuff. Yeah. What's interesting about that is that um, the uh, the Primeval Stream, there's, there's some amount of possible speculation that the Primeval Stream is the source of both magic with stars and uh, residual life and glintstone. Like, the founding reign of stars is what caused the meteor shower that rained down glintstone across the lands between for the first time. But within mm -hmm. the Founding Reign of Stars, it mentions that there was also a hint of amber that came with it. So if we imagine amber is representing the will of, like, the greater will and how it controls fate and the stars, you could assume that the Founding Reign of Stars is the source of both glintstone sorcery and worship of the greater will in that sense. And very specifically, oh. the Founding Reign of Stars is found within the heretical rise, as if it was deemed heresy by the Golden Order <laughs> for its concept, which is... You know, again, like, it, it's very interesting to me how that trope is reused, but in a much more nebulous sense. Yeah. They like to do, like, they like to have heresy in their games. Just be, like, exposing the, uh, the actual, like, uh, like, like the, uh, like, why is the, why is the Nameless King th thrown out of history? It's like, well, because he, he made friends with the dragons. It's like, they love heresy being just, like, Let's actually take a closer look at this thing you're asserting is holy and divine, and let's see what this stuff is actually about. That's a very good point. Um, yeah. I like how the ancient dra uh, the ancient dragons are then taken and like used to represent divinity. Like the ancient dragons mm -hmm. in Elden Ring are gold. They have scales of gold, which means that 
rather than Merica being the genesis of golden immortality, she took it from the ancient dragons. She took the concept of that, you know, when she usurped the order from them. Yeah. I guess going back to Fia and Annalise, they, they sort of end their story in the same conjunction with one of their own like one of the fanatics being able to murder them in a very gruesome way but only if the player allows it like very specifically it has to be something that the player just lets happen like yeah the only way that Alfred will ever get to Kanehurst is if you teach him how to get to Kanehurst the only way that uh Watcher D will ever be able to kill Fia is if you give him the armor and the sword to do so mm -hmm. It's always fun when you're like, you're like everybody loves from software and it's like, whoa, these worlds that they've created and all these interesting stories. And it's like, you start, you, you pick a bit, you pick a bit of the, like, you start picking at it, you start picking at the canvas and you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've seen this before. I've seen this before. <laughs> and then you dig a bit deeper and you're like, I've seen this twice before. I've seen, wait a minute. And then you're like, you just keep digging and you're like, where, when was the first time they actually did this? Because... I can see these ideas going all the way back to Kingsfield. And exactly. it's like, yeah, you're just like, so there's clearly a house style here and they just kind of like repackage and repurpose it. And it's just like, oh, it's so wonderful. I can't wait for our uh, Armored Core 6. I'm so looking forward to seeing what they do with that. I know, it looks so good, and they definitely took from Dune based off of the leaks about the game prior, so I'm, oh, I'm very interested. Long. Yes, <laughs> the red substance <laughs> known as melange. <laughs> uh, I think Villeneuve made a big mistake in the movie to, uh, because in the books, melange is described as being like this azure blue. And I think he made a big mistake not making it blue in the movie. Because like, oh, how, how cool would that have looked? It would have looked pretty good. I respect yeah. the adaptation he made, but I don't think it properly captures what Dune is, sadly. Like, it, it doesn't capture the political thriller of the dialogue, it more focuses on sweeping, mm -hmm. establishing shots, which just isn't exactly the style of the book, but it's still a very good movie, despite those flaws. Yeah, the, the book, the, like, the book, uh, the Dune books are like, uh, like, they're, they're, like it, I read them uh, at the same time I was reading Lord of the Rings, and like, Tolkien will give you like in the in the Hobbit. He like goes into such detail about like here's the here's the Hobbit that lived in a hole, and here's like his door, and he had a doorknob on that door in the middle of the center, and it was a circular door, and he's like going into details. And then Frank Herbert's just like, nah, these aren't actually characters. I'm just like exploring ideas. Now I need to explore this idea, so I'm gonna create a new character. And it's like, hey, asshole, could you describe the setting at least? I don't know what anything, what's happening here. <laughs> so much of it is left to your own imagination because it's very much just the dialogue. It's the, it's the philosophy before it's the reality. That's a very good way of like describing it. Where like Tolkien just he goes into such minutia over how the world looks, how people look, what they do, what they, you know, it's. How their languages work and such. Yes, exactly. He tries to make a mythological world while Frank Herbert wants you to think about your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think basically the same of uh, the Dune movie. I think it's really good. Um, uh, but I, I'm hoping that the second movie uh, kind of kicks things into overdrive and like, let's actually like explore the ideas of Dune. Um, because I think that's a, a much more interesting thing. I also like, I, I don't like Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides. I think he, you, you, I, I would have wanted somebody a bit more like, a bit more, a bit darker. Timothy Chalamet is just like a weird cricket man or a grasshopper he's a bit, boy. He's like a moody teenager. I, it doesn't fit. Uh, Paul's yeah. ending air as much. Like I think they cast him because he's like King Henry in some like British drama. But yeah. he uh he I don't think him or his mother capture the role very well. Like Paul is very much a character who starts as something of an earnest young man, but within yeah. coming into contact with the horrors of Dune and what it's required of him to like do things, he becomes a harder person and he he captures that commanding aura that's sort of there from the beginning like i 
I mean, I, I respect Dune as a movie, but it assumes Paul's villainhood way too early. Like, he didn't- he wasn't born and, like, grew up to a 16-year-old with, like, I'm gonna be emperor of the universe, I'm gonna do a bunch of <laughs> evil things. Like, he, he- he was forced into that by his decisions, and- Yeah, and, and he's, like, in the books- that. Yeah, and, and in the books, he's, like, like, the whole of Dune Messiah, and I think Dune Messiah is the best one. Dune it Messiah is, is often rated- my favorite book, I- <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think it's the best one too because it's the it's the only Dune book where the conflict of the ideas is like the driving like it's driven by the characters and like their love for each other and like Paul has this vision of his wife dying and he doesn't want to like make that vision come true so like it's just like and it's like he he he's constantly struggling against I don't want to be in charge of this machine but if I put my like if I let if I take my hands off the steering wheels, things are going to get even worse. And I know that because I can see the future. Exactly. Like Lido says, he's created a holy obscenity. And that starts with Paul as m the messiah to Lido's god emperor. He sets up the world that will follow, the idea of needing yeah. control to keep things from going to anarchy and destroying themselves. It's, uh, it's sort of tragic. Yeah. I love how much of a character study Dune 2 is, but I feel like we shouldn't spend too much time going into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not, the per it's not the purview of this conversation. <laughs> it should be, though. <laughs> yeah, um, sadly. We'll, we'll do a Dune conversation uh, one day. One and day. And we'll get 10 views. <laughs> 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 Literally, yeah. Like There'll be like maybe 50 people that know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so within the those Thalaxu uh, birthing pots what are the Thalaxu <laughs> birthing pots <laughs> and where Spoilers. are the Thalaxu women <laughs> no the Ixian I'm sorry the Ixians <laughs> the Ixian women <laughs> maybe they are the birthing pods Ooh, spoilers. oh my god <laughs> yeah it's, it's, a, like, oh, it's such a like cool revelation where it's like oh no because the Bene Gesserit they're all about like we have to become the perfect we have to perfect humanity but we have to remain human. And the Ixians are like, no, nah, we're just that. like goblin mode, goblin mode. And you're just like, oh my God, you people are so disgusting. Yeah. And like, you know, they they just represent all of the hated social, like, like this, yeah. this sort of observation from Frank Herbert that like a hated social minority is necessary and like he pities them. It, it's a very, it's very interesting as a dynamic to read, especially when considering like actual real life. I feel like Elden Ring actually ca captures that a little bit with how much it pays attention to like minority groups within its own story, like the Omen, the the Frenzied Flame Merchants, the Elbenoris yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting because like you have like you have this order which seems to want the hereditary principle of like, well, your father was the Elden Lord, so you should become the Elden Lord. But then at the same time, the game is very clear that like no, that like that shouldn't be how it works, but it it doesn't tell you like uh, that's that's so cool about the endings is that you can reasonably take any single one of the proposed endings and be like this is going to be a disaster, and it's like it's kind of like you know the God Emperor of Dune where like yeah it's a disaster and it's going to be horrible, but the alternatives are going to be worse. Exactly, like uh, someone has to take power, someone has to do it, otherwise like. Yeah, you know, the alternatives are worse, yeah. The alternative is Aldrich. <laughs> exactly. Um, so as people that, you know, like, obviously the Tarnished are the heroes of the story, and they, they make their choices, but all of the choices they make are within the purview of destiny to an extent. They are commanded by the Two Fingers, and they're only able to do what they do through the power of the Guidance of Grace. Uh, so in some ways, you see, like, Obviously, the Guidance of Grace is the echoed immortality mechanic that was with Hallowing. It's different, though, because it's not the Dark Souls power. It's the power of the Elden Ring being bestowed upon them. Mm. But it's like, the commander of those destinies is similar, because the Primordial Serpent, Framped, echoes the two fingers in a way. Uh, they both exist from the primordial prehistory of the world. You could even go so far as assuming that the two fingers are Plessid Jusax, given... Uh, Empyrean flash through the power of rebirth, or some sort of uh, physical corporeal body beyond his dragon form, and he communes with them. 
depending I, I on how you, I thought you were I thought you were gonna say that the two you could assume the two fingers are the missing heads of Placidus axe. Well, that's what the theory is based off of actually. It's basically <laughs> the the two fingers represent the two remaining heads of Placidus axe, uh that have then mm -hmm. gone on to serve the Golden Order. They were spared and now they just act through the two fingers, commanding people to continue the guidance of grace. And he very specifically used to have five heads. I mean, there's like there was the whole debate, was it four or five, based off of the old lord's talisman and how it's hard to actually determine from the model. But I think the general yeah. consensus was that it was intended to be five heads. So if you oh. look at the idea of the five heads representing the five fingers of a person, you then have the idea of the beastmen finding their intelligence through their five fingers and how they idolize the ancient dragons. You can sort of assume that when the ancient dragons were usurped, they in some ways were sort of willing compatriots with it. Uh, it, it that's, it's complicated. Uh, yeah, it's not something I, I know how, if I can articulate right now, but essentially <laughs> if you understand the uh, the three fingers, the three heads of Placidus Axe are the portions of the three fingers that are imprisoned so that they can, um, they can restrain the flame. Uh, imagine yeah. the Elden Ring in its protoform as being combined with the flame, but to create the Erd Tree a gentler power, they restrain it. It's sort of like similar to the Dark being restrained, and in both cases, the Dark over time becomes the Abyss gone wild, the Flame of Life over time becomes the Flame of Frenzy, because it's been repressed for so long. It's, it's become a warped part of the natural order because it's been constrained, so it's like... <laughs> I do like that. I, I think I, that, um, <laughs> see, my... My original theory with Placidus Axe, and again, I've not done nearly as much d deep diving on Elden Ring as I have the other games, was that he didn't lose his heads, he took them off. Like, he, oh. like, took... Yeah, because I thought, well, he has four heads. He probably took two off, because, like, when you meet him, he has, like, his heads in that coiled spiral shape that you see in, like, the sword for, of the Elden Beast, and you see it... Like, it's like a recurring visual motif. You see it in the very Elden Ring itself, like the Elden Ring of the... Which is, which is in the Malachis boss arena, which is like the old Elden Ring of the dragons. And I was thinking, oh, he, he probably did that to himself in order to become a more perfect vessel for the Elden Ring. But now that you tell me that he had five heads, I'm like, oh, did he take three heads off? Because three bad, two good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that's in some ways like three bad or two good is a very. <laughs> I uh, I think he did. I think um, two legs better. <laughs> it's like if I had to say any, if I had to make some sort of broad sweeping theory about Elden Ring, it'd be that uh, you've got the you've got the one great who is Placid Jusax, who echoes the great old one from Demon Souls and is the source of all life. It fractures apart. Mm -hmm. uh, very literally at first, like, Placid Jusax is a giant boulder of an ancient dragon that fractures into multiple ancient dragons that embody different concepts. And then eventually the beastmen are born from that, and you've got, like, a bunch of statues of beastmen that look like they're coming out of stone, they're emerging from stone. And then they also bury themselves in such a way that they can return to stone as a way of returning to the one great. Like, Feramazula is a mausoleum built to uh, venerate Placid Jusax is the lord of the ancient dragons and the origin of all life, but the greater will then comes to the earth, uh, the lands between, I guess. Um, and the greater will is the first flame of the setting. Like, it, we assume that life already exists through the crucible of life, but then the greater will adds destiny to that. It adds the causality of order, and that's embodied through the Elden Beast arriving on the Golden Star, but Beasts are attracted to lords, so the Elden Beast becomes the god to Placid Jusax's lord, um, mm. because he's the strongest being. But uh, the Greater Will has two major issues now. Essentially, the flame, the crucible of life, is so powerful that it, it threatens to devour all meaning. Um, you get the regressive force of flame. But then you also have, at the end of the Greater Will, like you've got, if you assume the Greater Will as being... Uh, destiny, then you have the Elden Ring as representing the ultimate destiny of the world through philosophy, and you've got the beginning of the Elden Ring, which is the giver of blessings and the beginning of life, but at the end of it is destined death. So all roads lead to death. The one who walks alongside flame will one day meet destined death. So you have the idea that 
The center pillar of the Elden Ring is the Crucible of Life and the different uh, great runes or the philosophies of life you walk through. Uh, mm -hmm. All of that is threatened to be devoured by the flame. Uh, meaning is devoured by chaos. So uh, to restrain the flame, the greater will may have wanted Plesidjusax to allow power to pass to Godfrey, and Godfrey could have cleaned up the old dynasty and brought things under one reign. Um, which is sort of half of it, you know, like you have, like his first act was to kill the fell god, which represents like the fell god and the fell gi and the gi fire giants are very much the flame in its primordial sense before it was restrained. And even they have that sort of regressive, all destroying aspect to them. Like if the fell god is somewhat based off of Baylor the Fimorian in like Celtic mythology, mm -hmm. who was a giant that everything he looked upon died, everything the fell god looked upon probably went frenzied the same way you've got that Eye of Sauron outside of Vike's village. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I guess the other part of it is that destined death had to be bound. So I, I think the issues, the fact that the prehistory exists with the issues that the today's world has gives some sort of credence to the idea that the ancient dragons and Plesidjusax in particular might have been willing compatriots to it, um, which would make sense why he would then act as the Two Fingers, uh, trying to keep yeah. what happened around it. It is very much a nebulous theory, though. <laughs> but I, I really like that, though. He's like, I, I am the will, I am the agent of the greater will, so I will act as the fingers. Exactly. This is like, that's so, it's like, ah, I love that. I love whenever, like, the conceit of a, of a fictional universe is leaned into for storytelling. Like, when Luke is on Dagobah, and they have to, like, Luke has to know that his friends are in danger. How do we tell them? He just sees it with the Force. It's like, the Force is a thing that exists in this universe. Use it to tell the story. And with this, it's like, well, you have the fingers, and here you have a dragon with so many heads. What if, what if he just uses some of his heads to mimic the fingers? Exactly. Like, it, uh, it just fits in a way. It's yeah. like, and like, if you, if you assume them as being based off of the primordial serpents, it fits even better because the primordial serpents are beings from the age of the ancient dragons, hence the idea of primordial. And the uh, the two fingers obviously Framped wants a new Lord of Cinder to continue the structure and stability of the world. The two fingers don't care about the tarnished; they just need a Lord to continue the stability and structure of the world. But then Kath knows the true nature of things, and he desires the dark to be unbound to have its time. The three fingers understand the true nature of things; they desire the flame to be unbound to have its time. Like it just it just fits <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like I have to now message a lot of people about the idea that he was imitating the two fingers. It's like it it's so obvious like that oh yeah that makes so much sense. Doesn't it? Uh, uh, um, I've seen people compare so Reichard uh, uh people have noticed this. He he looks like a fist when he's first um, when you first approach the great serpent. And a lot of people have taken oh, yeah. that to mean that it's like the fist of Satan, the fist of tyranny, which is a totally apt comparison. But if you want to assume that he's now in the form of the god-devouring serpent, the great serpent, if we imagine the great serpent as the serpent god during the prehistory, its original blasphemy, its original sin, is imitating the ancient dragons. So Placidius Axe at that time would have had all five heads and represented a full hand, just as... The Great Serpent does. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, it's so deep. <laughs> I know. It's just it keeps going. <laughs> yeah. That's really good. That's really good. Okay. Um where do you think we should uh jump back in? I'm trying to think of it. I think we could either spiral into a new topic. Uh I think Rykard as the Iron King or um Godfrey and Merica as being Gwyn, Vendrick, and Nashandra all in one would be very good points to get into. Or we could keep talking about Dune. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. We should do a Dune episode one day. I I, uh, so I got that. into I got into Dune uh, shortly after, like shortly before, but also like I read the first book, 
um, when before the movie came out, and then the movie came out, and I was like, let me actually go back to this because I don't think I understood it. And uh, then I got like really into it, and I've been talking to all my friends about it, and they're like, I'm just like waiting for the next movie. Don't spoil anything. And I'm like, man, I don't care about the next movie. Like, I care. It's gonna be amazing, probably. But like, I just want to talk about the books. I talk know. about the books. Like, I uh, when I read Dune four. I reread it like I reread it twice after because it was so good. And on my second rereading, I had this revelation. Okay, so one of the main points of Dune Four is that Leto wants to like try and curb cycles of violence within humanity. Like Frank Herbert has this large belief that an act of violence has its true magnitude echo throughout history into the future. So Paul Atreides, when he at the end of Dune One, when he takes uh, emperorship from like you know, the 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 Carinos, uh, he blows apart the shield wall with nuclear atomics, and that creates the rift in the, that creates the Idaho River in Dune Four, and during that battle, essentially in the sandstorm that follows from the Dune the wall being torn open. Uh, Paul's firstborn son dies. He's killed in the fight by Carino forces, by some of the Sadakar. Yeah. But that's and not he's never the end. mentioned again. <laughs> yeah, we don't even know his name. <laughs> yeah, well, not... he, I think his name was Leto. Oh, was it really? Both I think, think, I think so. Leto? I believe that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's very fitting then, because his other son dies from that same action, because the Idaho River is what Leto II falls into as oh. the God Emperor. That's what kills him. <laughs> Isn't that, like, mind-blowing a little bit? I don't, like, I don't even know how to, like, conceptualize it, you know? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's really good. I never picked up on that. Yeah. I really like in Dune that uh, <clears throat> Leto's, original Leto, like, Dad Leto's plan is... I believe that the heart, just the hardness of Arrakis, breeds stronger people than the Sardaukar, and I think because the environment is so hard that they have to be that much tougher than those prisoners turned soldiers, and he like he bets all on that, and it's he's right. <laughs> he's completely right. Yeah, desert power. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, but it's also, uh, I, I, it's just like Dune has so many cool ideas. Like you have, uh, you have. Uh, 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 what's uh, what's Chani's father's name? Uh, not still. I keep. No, not Stilgar. Um, her father, the uh, the um, the the terraforming guy. Oh, oh. Um, why am I not remembering his name? He turned into a girl in the movie. Yeah, I think that's why I can't remember <laughs> because <laughs> it's like that's there's that disconnect. Uh, I think it's like. I, I keep going Kynes. back to still. It's it's Liet Kynes. Kynes. Yeah. Yeah, Liet Kynes. I love Liet Kynes' death in the book is so much better than in the movie, where he's just like walking through the desert and having these like hallucinatory visions of his conversations with his father about like how we have to conquer our t like environment and change it to make it better fit for us. Meanwhile, he's just being like baked in the sun with vultures looking over him and the environment is just killing him. It's just like like, yeah. Man, oh. I think it's the best chapter in Dune One. Honestly, it's very it's heart wrenching, emotional, and it captures all of like the ideas of living within the environment and trying to master it, but never having that full mastery of nature all in the one. Yeah. It even captures the lore aspect because if you assume Liet Kynes is having taken in spice all of his life, he could be tapping into his genetic memories. He could be actually speaking with his father in that hallucination, since all humans live within the genetic memories of their descendants, like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's such a good book. <laughs> so, yeah, um... I guess we should finish out Rykard as a topic. So, we've co we covered one aspect of his inspiration, like Aldrich as being emblemized by his greed, but within mm -hmm. the concept of his warmongering, he he echoes the Iron King. So the Iron King was someone who collected power to himself, seeking strength. And at the penultimate conclusion of that strength, he actually lost control of it, and his greed ended up with him falling into the bottom of his volcano, and 
he turned into this giant monster, and it caused his entire castle to just sink into the caldera of the volcano he built it on. Which, I mean, building your castle on a caldera is already a pretty bad idea, but you know. <laughs> uh, we then get Rykard as a concept, where he's this lord of blasphemy, this lord of tyranny, and he, um, he seeks to, uh, he seeks power, so he, um, there's this quote in game that the power of volcano, like, harnessing the power of volcanoes is the greed of serpents and man. So it sort of implies that as the great serpent, after being combined into it, he tried to harness the power of the volcano that his manor was built on, but he failed. Yeah. And that's where you get the idea that in both cases, the Iron King's Keep was devoured by the volcano. Uh, Rykard's manor, Gelmir in Hole, was destroyed by the volcano's eruption, which was probably... Uh, happened because, you know, Rykard tried to harness it in his, you know, sort of, like, greed. And I, like, there's a number of bosses that were taken out of, like, a natural area that they might have been expected to be in. Like, Estelle was meant to swoop down on you from above, but now he's just in a big cave. The ancestor spirits, you just teleport to big caves to fight them. And Rykard in particular, he's in a big cave, but there might have been the implication that at some point he could have risen from that big lava lake in the center of the uh, the volcano manor outside the throne room that you climbed to after the church. Oh. I don't know how likely that is. I just it, It's just a lot of parallels I find interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think that because I've, I've watched a lot of uh, Let's Plays of Elden Ring with like randomizer mods on. Rykard is really interesting in those randomizer mods because I th he's the only large enemy, like huge enemy, that doesn't freak out when you put him in a different environment. Because like you do that to Radon, you do that to any of the dragons. They're like they move around too much that they just don't function there. But Rykard isn't like teleporting or zooming around the battlefield. He moves much more slowly. So, you know, he he probably could be could have been fought in a like, a bit more of a directed sort of environment. Like, he didn't need a gigantic arena. So, yeah, it's, it's possible. I also think that... Um, so, the Iron King... Now, this is, like... I'm, I'm digging back a few... Like, a year ago, where I first, last read about the Iron King. Um, he... His queen is the one that came for him when he was already gone, right? That's a good point. Yeah, his... Um... Yeah, it was after he had, like, it's after his death, the old Iron King, his queen came and she, like, danced herself into a mist, which Tanith echoes as being a dancer, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, um, you kind of have that, uh, well, maybe not. I was going to say, you kind of have that in Rykar too, but I'm like, he doesn't really have a, a queen to that extent. No, and Tanith met him beforehand. I feel like the only yeah. similarity is mostly the dancer. Something I do think yeah. is interesting is that uh, the Iron King, not the old one, but the person that led the Iron King astray was a pyromancer named Egil, which is a very similar name to Egle as the Great Serpent. So, um, oh, they can't keep getting away with it. <laughs> Someone has to stop them. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, that's cool. I also love the uh, when you first go into the volcano manor, and it's like, oh hey, remember Kanehurst? Remember how we did a Dracula? Now we're doing a volcano Dracula. It's like, oh, okay, that, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, and, rising uh, up, you can really see the Vlad the Impaler influence on his character. <laughs> yeah, 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 and uh, but like, yeah, but like at the same time, it's it's not it it doesn't have that sort of gothic sentiment to it, and. I think the strength of the Volcano Manor is really just in that sort of opening and in the, like, the quest where they're sending you out to kill Tarnished, which, by the way, really interesting that Rykard is sending people out to kill Tarnished. Um, but then, like, in the Volcano, like, in the Volcano Town itself, it's like, I think that kind of dips, where, like, I, I like it. I love running around on the rooftops in these games, but I feel like there's something missing, like, some sort of, uh, some sort of, like, encounter, like, if, if there was, like, an, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, like, an NPC who was, like, also going through the Volcano Manor or something, but I don't know. I, I see where you're coming from. The Volcano Manor level itself 
doesn't really uh, like it's just a it's just a u-shape circular thing where you go through it and there's not a bunch of hard fights it's it's mostly yeah. like immersive storytelling through what's there like you see how prider rykard was the inquisitor of the golden order and how he imprisoned people and stuff but um it and in the church, get... you see like the serpentine skin being draped over it, and that's like that's a visual you also have in Sekiro in like the Mipu village, where because it's like the serpent, it's the god, and you have the skin of the god, and you hang it on, on top of it, and then like there's a god skin, uh, uh, noble. Yeah, it's a noble. Yeah, yeah, it's an, like, and it's like it's the same idea of like you're covering yourself in the flesh of this divine thing, but like for the for the um, for the godskin noble it's kind of like an act of uh, like cruelty like kill the gods but for Rikard, it's like no there's like there's a divine actual divinity to this like and we have to revere it yeah that's really interesting uh just the like the way that they deal with reverence and blasphemy like Rikard as a person mm -hmm. despite being blasphemous is still a holy icon he's a holy figure because he is his own god at that point like yeah. You know, the Lord of Blasphemy is someone that chooses to devour the gods by becoming a god. There's some sort of irony there. And, like, of course, the yeah. iron, there's further irony in the sense that Volcano Manor is built to emulate the Round Table Hold, and Rikard, even to the end, he still respects the amount of strength that Godfrey had, because he feels like the true way that a ruler is is that you should rule through strength. That's what befits a crown. That's his motto. It's why he tries to become the strongest. And that's why Bernal, when you kill him, is like, well, that's what he expected when he set out down that path. You know, live by the sword, die by the sword. If you want to be the strongest, then there'll be a stronger person eventually. Like, Yeah, you can't stay on top forever. No. Ah, uh, yeah. Also, um, oh, I had something I was going to talk about with, uh, with Rikard, but it completely flew out of my head. <laughs> so valid. Meh. <laughs> So uh, let's talk about Radan a little. Do, do you see any similarities in him to previous characters from games? You know, like Carrie and family, we can just sort of cover him. Because I'm trying to think of, like, who is Radan similar to, if anyone? He seems like a much more original character with his idolization of Godfrey. But... Um, uh, well, I'm thinking, like, he's a, like, he, he's kind of, like, a little bit like uh, Genichiro. But where Genichiro was like, Genichiro failed to become like a great war, like he was a good warrior and all that, but he like, he never quite became uh, Ishin, right? Ishin was able to stave off all the other clans in Japan, subdue them and keep Ashina free. Genichiro doesn't have the power to recreate that feat. But like, Radan is the strongest of the demigods. So it's like, there's not like a complete one to one there. No, I think Radan is a much more original character. Yeah, I um really like he's very much a character that's meant to emulate Godfrey, who is much very original in his own right, except for his like Gwyn inspiration. But Radan doesn't draw from that Gwyn inspiration. So really I feel like Genichiro is the most apt observation we could have, because Genichiro is someone that through his idolization of uh Ishin's unflinching power and strength, he tries to make his own strength. Uh, you know, like, Radan even self-describes him as the cub of the battlefield, like, while uh, Godfrey is the lord of the battlefield, and, like, you know, they both have the idea of lions, so it's definitely, like, you get the sort of uh, father figure idolization there. It's interesting. Yeah. And it's like, it's the adoptive father, whereas, like, you know, Radan is not the actual son of Ishin. And, like, Genichiro is not the actual grandson. Like, he, he may be. There's, like, hints that, oh, maybe because Ishin, like, Ishin had some fun with some of the Japanese women there. And it's, like, maybe he had, like, maybe Genichiro is his bastard son grandson or something like that. Um, but, uh, like, with Radan, it's, no, he's, he's the son. He's, like, the truest son you had. And he's not even your son. And that's kind of, like, that's actually, that might be a George R.R. R. Martinism. Where, like, you know, um, I don't know if you've read Game of Thrones or, like, House of the Dragon or anything like that. Have you? I've read uh, the first two Game of Thrones books and then watched the shows, but I haven't read as much as I should have. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, the idea there, uh, and this is in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, George R. R. Martin's characters, 
it's this idea that the sun, like you have like Jon Snow and Ned Stark and Jon Snow is actually like the son of Ned Stark's sister. And, uh, and I believe, uh, like Rhaegon Targaryen or something like that. I don't remember its name, but like, but he's, he is the truest son of Ned Stark, right? He, he takes after him more truly than any of his other children do. And you have Holy this idea shit. of, that's, that's so smart. Go on, Bo, go on. That's <laughs> genius. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. But, and then there's this idea of like, um, like in house of the dragon, um, um, not not to go into spoilers on where the story goes, but uh, in season one, there's like this whole, it's just in the television show, but it's also in the books, uh, in the book. Um, there's this conflict between like, uh, who is like the true boar, like who deserves the throne more? Aegon the second or Rhaenyra? And Rhaenyra has like this bastard sons. And her oldest son is like, yeah, he's a bastard son. And everybody knows it. It's very obvious. But when you compare him to Aegon, like, Aegon is, like, he, he has a lot of bastard children that live in just fighting rinks where they'll have, like, their teeth sharpened so that they can fight. And these are just, like, this is, these, this is who you want as your king? This guy, he's like, a, he's, like, a womanizing drunk. He's just, like, a total slob and a total idiot. He's not capable or he, of ruling. He doesn't really want to rule. He's just, like, garbage. And then you have Rhaenyra's oldest son. And he's, like, yeah, he's a bastard. But he's learning Targaryen. He's like he's like learning the history of the land. He's le like he's got proper like he he knows how to present himself. And he's like, well, even though he's a bastard, he feels like he's so much more deserving of this. Um, and they're all like they're the children of uh, Harlan Strong, like Harlan Breakbones, and and it's like th that's a very George R R Martin idea, I think, more so than Miyazaki that. The the true born heir doesn't come from your blood. It's just like oh, you you find him out there somewhere. I uh I I actually see that a lot because it was definitely me. It was definitely Martin that wrote the initial concepts of these characters that were then transformed. So for him to write like you know obviously he's writing all of the carry the two Carrion brothers as being very I like they they idolize Godfrey, while the Golden Lineage is somewhat more elitist and more entrenched in its own power. Like, Godric has an axe that resembles Godfrey's. He, he, um, he talks about, a lot about how he's the lord of all that is golden, but, like, all he really has a claim to is his blood. He doesn't idolize any of the yeah. traits that made Godfrey who he is. And, like, even Godwin, in my opinion, was more of a mama's boy than a daddy's boy. I, I think Godwin definitely followed in America's vibe and like did what she wanted more than simply being someone that lived for strength alone and for combat the way godfrey did yeah so it's very apt and like if we even assume radon as being like the john snow analog then you have john snow as the union of fire and ice and you yeah. have radon's parents and ranala and radigan as radigan representing the fury aspects of the crucible and regression with his red hair and all of that anger and stuff and then you have Renala as representing the icy cold of the moon and the causality of the game, you know? Yeah, that's good. That is good. Next episode, we have to talk about uh, Godfrey and like how... Because Godfrey, um, or Hora Lu, is... Uh, and this was pointed out to me by uh, Sinclair Lore, uh, the Sinclair Lore podcast. And they, they talked about how he's the only character... The only one, the only one of the gods who, um, who isn't made stronger with the unity he has, right? So everything comes in like binaries. You have like Reichardt and the serpent. You have um, Radon and, and his horse, Leonard, I think. And like everybody, like you have Melania and Mikola. And you have like everybody comes in these sorts of dualities. And these dualities make them stronger. But Godfrey... His union with Sirach makes him weaker. And it's like he, to become stronger, he has to get rid of it so that he can truly be himself. I love that idea. Yeah, it's a complete reversal on all of the other two faced uh, characters you've been going through. Like, yeah. Godfrey's second aspect is the stronger of the two, it's something he represses. Uh, it's very interesting. I think I saw a YouTube video that was talking about color theory in Elden Ring and about how Godfrey 
essentially his armor in the first phase is blue, which represents the civility and, like, the sort of noble ideals of his life. But then after he kills Sarash and disrobes, uh, he's painted in blood, which is red, and that represents the ferocity of his character, now unleashed, which is sort of cool. Yeah, but also what's cool is that, like, when you kill him, he's like, your strength befits a crown. And even when he beats you, he doesn't, like, talk down to you. He's like, like even though he's this crazy Conan the Barbarian, blood-soaked barbarian, he's the only, like, he's the one of the lords who's like, no, you know what? Like, I recognize you. I recognize you as strong. I see that in you, and I don't care where you come from. Like, I just, I recognize that you have this power within you, and I respect you for it. There's a and nobility like, wow. to it. Like... Yeah, yeah, there's, like, the true noble is, like, the crazy, the crazy muscle uh, barbarian guy? Like, what? Apparently. Because <laughs> it's, like... You know, he's like, brave, tarnished, you have fought long and hard, but alas, I have returned. Like, he, he recognizes your deeds, he recognizes what you've fought for, but there can only yeah. be one lord, and he's not going to sit by while you go to marry his wife. He's gonna, he's gonna do something about it, and like, right, he's yeah. also angry about Morgoth, like, as, like, he, yeah, he's he, pissed he at him. you, he hates you, he's mourning his son's death, but... He's not letting it show. He's he's keeping it under grips. Like it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So we definitely have to wrap up the episode now. It has been a huge pleasure having you on. I, I love this discussion, and we definitely have to reconvene for a part two and like a Dune episode oh, someday. <laughs> Um, we can get more in depth about Godfrey as being Gwyn, but split apart into Gwyn and Merica, and how Gwyn and Merica then echo Vendrick and Nishandra. Like, there, there is so much more to cover. I don't even know if we went over half of it. Like, <laughs> uh, we kept talking about Dune. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, all roads lead lead to Dune. It is it's such a politically expansive book. It covers anything anything else could cover. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Even the concept of power coming under siege and absolutism control schemes, like you can't talk about that without being like, oh yeah, Frank Herbert did it first. <laughs> <laughs> he who has the power to destroy a thing controls the thing. <laughs> this, uh, you just read this and you're like, oh damn, he's right. Yeah. I actually I wrote a fan fiction of Merica going to talk to Morgoth in the moments before she shattered the Elden Ring during the first events of Lindel, like as she like sort of broke and shattered inside. And it's like mm. directly modeled after a couple of different Dune 4 chapters, because I thought Leto's <laughs> point of view fit Merica's like emotional ideas so well. Like <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a, this is a the God Emperor of Dune is like it's such a wonderful character because He's so cold and ugly and disgusting, but, but at the same time, he's like 3,500 years old. And even then, there's like, there's these little glimpses of humanity, and you're like, oh, oh, he's like, he's repressing it. He, he, he is human. Like, he, all these years, these millennia he's been alive, it's, he's still in there. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's beautiful. Like, Moneo, when he describes Leto as not killing anyone, is like, Leto lives within the cradle of God. He lives within the worm. There's like a there's a difference between Leto as a as a young boy, Leto as the God Emperor, and the worm, you know, it's it's a confluence of identities. Yeah. And he yeah. yeah, and he's like he loves humanity too, and it's like, oh, oh, he like he's kinda like a man made God who's like it was kind of cool, it doesn't suck, but it's like, at the same time, he's the worst person in the world, and in the fifth book, they talk about him as like, well, he was a colossal storm, and he, like, the, the god emperor was a, was a colossus, or a titan, I don't remember the exact wording, but they talk about how he moved everyone, and every every force of the universe bent around him. That's so cool. Yeah, he was, he was the crux upon which humanity rested, the, the viewing glass, the, the you know, like the condensation of all viewpoints. Uh, Is there anything you want to shout out from your own channel that you might have coming up or that you released recently? Um, um 
coming up i don't know uh i have one video that's currently just on patreon uh that will be made available probably late january um but uh if anybody here has been interested in the conversations we've been having and wants to have a bit of a primer on some of the stuff i've talked about before uh watching episode two of this two of two two of three however many we do uh i did i do a lot of from software videos uh, probably, I think if you only need to, if you can just watch one, I'd recommend the Sekiro one. I think the Sekiro video I did, like six hours long. But I think that's probably the most concise sort of distillation of all these different ideas from all these different games that I've made so far. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll link that below. Definitely give it a watch. Uh, oh. Okay, well, thank you for joining us at the Roundtable Hold, ACR Aesthetics. Uh, Ah, great to be here, great to be here. <laughs> Thank you again to ACR Aesthetics for joining me at the Roundtable Hold to talk about everything Elden Ring, and even a little bit of Doom. Stay tuned for part 2 of X of what is now a series, let's call it Elden Ring Parallels. I'm also happy to announce that the Elden Kings will finally follow a release schedule for our podcast. Expect bi-weekly releases for now, at the beginning of the second and fourth weeks of every month. If you had any questions about topics, or your own theories to share, then leave a comment or something. Or don't. I'm not your mother, I can't tell you what to do. And if there's any topics you'd like to hear about the future, then don't hesitate to send a tweet over towards the Elden King's Twitter, or one of our other social medias. Thank you for listening, and as always, don't you dare go hollow on me.